is every day we're bringing on different speakers and guests and people that I've had contact with that are just amazing people. Uh, I met Orrin about a decade ago and he came and spoke at Metal and then he's been on my radio show a bunch of times and Orrin's a, a class act. I always say it like that. Orrin's based down in the San Diego area. You've probably seen one of his books. He's got a few, but he's got two out there. He's got, of course, Pitch Anything and Flip the Script. And I kind of want to use this as an opportunity for you guys to ask questions, understand where he is at, what he's able to do, and how we can utilize his skills for us to conquer anything. Hey, Orrin, let's see you. Are you there? Come on, buddy. I know you're there. You're using some funky secret handle, aren't you? Orrin. There yeah, you can, you, can you hear me? <laughs> I like that background. All right. <laughs> Hey, I, hey, I love your green screen, Ken. It looks like you're at home. You know, you could you could barely see uh, you know, the trailer that you live in. That's um, yeah. The green screen is wonderful. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm a I'm a van lord. I own all these vans in Venice yeah. and I rent them out. Hey Orrin, um yeah. before you became the famous Orrin Klopp, what were you doing before all this? Yeah, hard work. So <laughs> So, uh, not unlike, uh, you know, Chris Miller, who you just talked to, I was in investment banking and M&A and financial markets and buying and selling, Think, you know, we, uh, companies. And what I came to realize over time is, you know, it sounds fancy, you're buying a company and it, and it is finance, but ultimately it is the highest form of sales because you're selling money, right? And money is a commodity and so there's some really specialized skill sets you need to buy and sell money and then it's a discipline it's an extreme discipline when you're dealing with money it's so black and white it's so binary the people who deal with it are so experienced um there, there's a clear set of rules so to survive in buying and selling assets putting money in taking money out and you take the discipline of those sales skills and you put them in average sales environments, not to be mean to people, but they kick ass, right? It's sort of, a, you know, and I've said this to you before, uh, but for the new people listening in, you know, there's, for those of you who are in Los Angeles, there's an, a North Face store on North Beverly Drive. Most amazing North Face, uh, it's the factory outlet and they have the most incredible stuff there, right? But, and, and it's, 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 it's two feet above sea level. They don't build the stuff they don't design the stuff that goes in the North Face store at two feet above sea level. They have to go up, you know, to, in Nepal and the Himalayas and K2 and Everest. That's so, so I feel, you know, long answer to your question, but the sales skills that I have were built in the most extreme, most exotic sales environments in banking and finance. And then I brought them down to, you know, really uh, um, the day to day of selling software, selling services, selling accounting systems, whatever it is. And, uh, and they're very effective. So that's what I was doing before is finance. And now I've coached, you know, millions of people on sort of the, the basics of how to uh, a pitch something, you know, so, you know, but you know the rest of that story. Well, I just want people to know, hey, it's, this is a, not a rated G show. So Orrin, you can go to the extreme levels you like to take it. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, good. You have a question for Orrin, make sure you put it inside the chat. Uh, Oren, uh, we had Chris Voss on yesterday from Never Split the Difference, his book, and we talked about the idea of different closings where it's a win-win, zero-sum game, a win-win-win. If you close it the right way, besides the pitch, but the close, is there a win-win scenario or a zero-sum game in your book? Yeah, so I like Chris. He's a wonderful guy, right? Unfortunately, in the world that I live in, right, I don't have eight hours to sit outside of a door with somebody in it, you know, with armed guns. And I, I mean, we, I got to talk to Chris, you know, directly. If I say to someone, Chris's signature line, in the world that I live in, right? I mean, we're closing a $160 million deal right now. You know, Chris Miller, we just talked to, you know, a lot of the guys on here dealing millions of dollars. But, you know, just say your average Joe Bag of Donuts, $3 million deal, $3 million deal. If I say, so how am I supposed to do that? In an intractable point of negotiation, which is Chris's signature line. The guys that I'm working with say, sorry, what the fuck did you say to me? I said, well, how am I supposed to do that, right? Uh, so if I say, hey, look, um, um, if they ask me for a, a price reduction, right? Hey, we'd, uh, we'd like to do this deal, two and a half million, three million seems high. 
Uh, if we're at two and a half million, um, you know, I think we're in a go forward position. You know, we've got the, the debt lined up. The equity is in position to close. We think we can close in 35 days, but you do need to uh, relax a little bit on the pricing given COVID. And if I say, how am I supposed to do that? They will literally say, what the fuck are you talking? What language are you talking? Are you going to do the price reduction? Right. And well, how am I supposed to do that? And they're like, you want us to suggest to you how the fuck you are going to reduce the price? We're See this finger? It's going to hit the delete button on this Zoom call. All right? Unless you can start talking things we understand. So, so I know Chris has been in hostage environments and sort of that might work when, when you're negotiating for a car or furniture or selling something. But with people who know what they're doing and you say, how am I supposed to do that? They're going to say, I don't know. That's not my problem. That's your problem. But I'm going to get off this call in a few minutes. And sort of that's my topic today is the, the you know, time frames. You can still sell. I have, all of our companies are selling. Um, you know, the, certainly the stuff that's going away is hospitality. It's travel. Um, it is, uh, um, you know, some forms of healthcare, right? So doctor, dentists and doctor's offices. But everything else is up. It's not like the $20 trillion economy went away. Most of the stuff shifted. You know, my buddy Rick. And I don't want to disclose, you know, um, uh, what, you know, what he's doing, but you know, his company is select blinds. They're up, you know, the company next to him does flooring for gyms. They're up. I sent out an email yesterday. I tried to buy a rogue rack, you know, because I'm building a gym in my driveway. They're sold out for weeks. Like, at, um, you know, I, a guy used to work with me now runs a $10 million, um, lawn supply company. In other words, he ships manure. He's sold out, out of manure. Okay. <laughs> So everybody I know is up if they're not in hospitality and travel, uh, but the time frames for selling stuff is much shorter. You don't have the hour, thirty minutes, or the, and the, and the chat and everything like that. So well, know. there's a panic. There's a panic sell going on for a lot of people too. You know, they're they're panicking and they're acting irrational, and that's an opportunity for people that are, are trying to close deals in some ways, right? Yeah, so there's a much more complex selling process. The, the laziness, the stuff that you used to sell, you know, very easily. Oh, how am I supposed to do that? Sort of the one-liners. That stuff is not going to be working today. But if you, if you have some sales discipline, right, and you do some, a few things correctly and maintain discipline, uh, you know, mainly around neediness and self-control, you know, it's a big one, then you're going to close deals today, uh, you know, as easily as you ever did. I mean, Ken, you're busy. We're busy. We just signed 25 new companies, uh, and and you know you're growing quickly. I mean, there isn't a person that sort of is at my in in my peer group of size of company and kind of thing that isn't up or not changing their year plan. So you should not be down. But there are some sales disciplines. You got now a Zoom way of communicating. This is where we're living. I'm not sure how long you think it's going to last. I just hung up the phone with Simon Leslie. Simon, who's on this call right now in the UK, he was just telling me that Disney is going to start opening parks as early as June 1st, okay? Uh, I'm working with uh, a team in, out of UAE who wants to put on a gigantic event. They're saying September 1st, we're going to plan the event. So we have a small window of maybe a month and a half to take advantage of the yeah. Zoom world. Do you conduct the meeting differently when you're on Zoom? Well, it's funny, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you yesterday celebrated Passover, right? But we did a Zoom Passover with my mom, who knows fucking nothing about Zoom, okay? And so, <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, but, uh, so the, the Zoom meetings, uh, there is a fatigue factor to them, especially the way Zoom bounces around and that you're looking at somebody who's not talking and not in the conversation, you know, is there... E so think, you have to know how to run a meeting on a clear agenda, right? What you want to do today, I feel like, with a Zoom meeting, and this is what we're doing differently, is we're letting people know how that meeting is going to be run to set their expectations. Listen, was, you know, and can you start right on time? Does anybody need fluids in or out? If not, let's go. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to run you through a shortened version of our pitch, what it is, the big idea, the solution, the problem, uh, the ROI, what we think the timeline is, uh, and what we might or might not do with each other. That's gonna take 12, 13 minutes. Then we're gonna give you five minutes to put in context what you're doing in your problem and see if our circles overlap. If they do, we'll spend two or three minutes figuring out next steps, all right? That's gonna take 20 minutes start to finish. If we need more time, you know, we'll adjust the clock a little bit. Ready, let's go. Now that says, 
this is going to be a professionally run meeting and it calms people down that they're not on one of these wild zoom meetings that they don't know how long it's going to be how it's going to run what the agenda is control the agenda yeah, yeah. yeah. well i mean so hold on a second though I, I feel like that's different from an agenda right Th that's here's what we're going to do on this meeting is different from hey let me tell you guys the agenda right okay. I, I feel like meetings don't are, are self-evident uh and so they don't need an agenda they need structure so that's different here's the structure of this meeting we're going to go first we're going to tell you what we have then we're going to give you some time right then you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, uh your problem and how you feel uh, you know our solution fits we're trying to find a go forward path if that works we'll set up a next meeting that's the structure i, I feel like agendas um uh meetings don't need an agenda right because then then they feel um um like you know what contrived right again i get you want something that at least has a fixed amount hey we're gonna do this for 12 minutes that's all i got let's dive into it and that's the goal yeah absolutely okay and, and yeah I, I need you now to go after something that's probably on a lot of people's minds right now by the way if you have a question for orn put it inside the chat because i'm going to tell you this time is going to go so damn fast you're going to want to get this in orn top of mind for people right now I got to open up the dialogue with my landlord, either on a personal side or on a commercial side, because I just don't have the resources to pay the rent right now. How do you pitch that? How do you set that up? Well, I, I mean, this is the benefit of being in finance, and I do see some good questions popping up here. But here's the reality. Landlords have access to financing that you don't have access to. Okay? So all they have to do is call up their lender and say, it's a three-minute phone call. Hey, we want a two-month deferment. Right, so this is not a complicated, you know, conversation. You say, hey, I know you guys have access access to the capital markets and to your lender. They're giving out two month deferment. Right, we're going to participate in that. Um, and I know you're probably preparing an email to send to us so we can participate. But I'm letting you know we're participating in the two month deferment that you're getting. Got it. Okay, let's go to some questions, Brett. You're the first yeah. question. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Go for it. Yeah, Orrin, um, thanks for uh, coming on. Big, big fan of um, Flip the Script and Pitch Anything. My, my question is, what's the biggest difference you've seen between top closers and everybody else? Because there's, there's the 1% and then everybody else kind of falls in that, in that big spectrum. Yeah, so, so two things right now. You either have to have uh, for real or imaginary in your mind pipeline. If you if it if the buyer doesn't perceive that you're busy and doing lots of things and transacting, it will come across as neediness. Okay, so that's number one. If this is your only buyer for the entire month, you have to figure out somehow in your mind to to get in a mindset or phase where you are busy, right? If they feel like they are, you know, um, one of one, special, a special snowflake, they're gonna, they're gonna, um, they might buy, right? But they're gonna drag their heels, uh, drag their feet, and they're gonna require discounting, and you're gonna have to give up that discount. You have to maintain a sensibility of being busy. One, you know, there's a million ways to do that. You're an athlete. I'm an athlete. Ken's an athlete of sorts. Uh, and so being even being busy might be, I'm investing seven hours of my day in staying healthy because wellness right now is important and I have one hour to work. Right. And so that would make you super busy, but you have to, in your mind, get some way to have, be, be extremely short on time, compressed and busy and be doing the buyer a favor. Now that can come across as shitty, right? Uh, you, you know, Hey, I'm doing you a favor so that the perception has to be. I'm getting time with you. That's why I'm suggesting these compressed time frames. If you go into a call and you have one hour or an hour and a half or two hours, or there seems like to be no end in sight to the amount of time you have, you're not busy. Nobody's going to do business with you today, COVID era, unless you, they, they perceive that you're handling lots of other accounts and, and you're busy and it's an opportunity to work with you. That's one. Number two is you uh, um, have to convey somehow and flip the script is great for that um that you're an expert in what's going on now if they feel like they're dealing with somebody who is you know was good in november and december and january but they haven't adjusted to the moment mm. if they 
now, now we, we talk a lot about this internally. I just want to tease this out a little bit. I see some other questions coming up, but you have to adjust to the moment, but not be subsumed in it. Okay. So you can't, are you watching these commercials like Budweiser commercial, whatever that are, that are pre COVID, you know, they're like people hanging out on a bar and they're hugging and they're partying and everything. You're like, this is tone deaf. Right. Uh, and, and it's, it stands out. You know, we're watching Lego Masters and a commercial. Even our six-year-old can pick out those commercials. Hey, why are those people so close to each other and hanging out? So it's tone deaf when you're ignoring COVID completely. But it can go the other way. If you are absorbed by it and it feels like your whole world is anchored by it, you're talking about it too much. Um, it's, uh, um, it, it feels, uh, you know, what's the word? Pandering. So you, so you can't be tone deaf and you can't be pandering to the situation. So you have to nod to COVID, reflect the ways that it has adjusted, you know, the deal or the business, and then move on with the sale. And then the last thing is, it's just a fact, you know, I'm a no discounting guy, but today somebody is going to feel like, uh, you know, because of all the news that unless they're getting some kind of discount or deal, that um, it's going to be more difficult than to transact. They feel it's your responsibility to give them a deal because of COVID. So you have to find some way to frame the transaction as they are getting a COVID era deal without it affecting your margin. So those are three things. Be busy, you know, have pipeline or reflect that you have pipeline. Um, so you're not needy during the call. Compress the timelines, nod to COVID, but don't uh, be, be pandering to it. And you have to give some kind of framing around a discount or it's gonna to be too difficult to close a real deal. Those are sort of my- Bernd uh, is joining us. He is our mentor for today. Uh, of course, if you have a question, pop it right, side, right inside the chat. Later on today at five o'clock PST, William Quigley is gonna join us giving his outlook at what's going on with the economy, geopolitics, and crypto. You don't wanna miss that. Our next question is coming from Barry. Barry, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Barry, Barry, or do you need help? Barry, I don't like when I can't see people. So here's the deal, guys. Barry, I'm going to let you ask a question, but I always want to see people. Barry, what's your question? He's not going to ask. So how about this? Um, there are different types of meetings. Orrin is discussing one of 10 different types, aka sales meetings. Of course, there's different meetings, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think so. Uh, here, here's what I think. People are coming to Zoom meetings with very um, low expectations, but low desire. If you are in charge of that meeting and run that meeting the way they run meetings internally in their company, in essence, the style and the pace and the language and the, um, uh, the, the outcomes match how they like to run meetings in their own company, the bar is going to raise, right? And that's what you want to do. You want to raise the stakes. People are coming to Zoom meetings today. And, you know, this is the thing to write down. The stakes are low. Hey, I'm coming to the meeting. I'm going to hear what the company is suggesting, whether it's a sales call, whether it's a meeting, whether it's a logistics call. I'm going to think about it. All kinds of emails are going to go out. And it's basically low stakes situation. What you want to do is raise the stakes. Something is happening here for real, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm investing my time for a reason. There is going to be an outcome of this meeting. In a sales meeting, the outcome is I'm either going to help you solve your problem or you're going to go fuck yourself. Right? I mean, not exactly, but you know, look, I don't have your problems. We came to the sales call because you have a problem. Not I don't have the problem. We're doing fine. You have the problem, right? I fixed this problem all day long. I've, I've solved your specific problem. All 19 things that you need done, I do that. I've done it a thousand times. This is like, I, I, I press a that was easy button and all your problems get fixed. But I don't know if I'm willing to press the that was easy button for you. Okay, that's, you know, that's a sales meeting. But in these other meetings, you have to raise the stakes because people are coming to Zoom meetings again with very low expectations, low probabilities of things happening and low stakes. You know, one thing that does happen when you're not in a Zoom meeting and you're meeting in person and you say, yeah, let's do the deal and you sign a document and right then and there, what are you doing? Are you like real time? Uh, that happens. 
are you real time sending them a DocuSign right there in the meeting going, here you go, let's sign it right now in front of yeah. each other. I mean, absolutely. We're doing, you know, DocuSign is the greatest thing since canned beer, right? Because now they're not printing it and fa trying to fax it and, and jot knotting it and PDFing it and signing it and get wet signatures. Uh, we are trying to, look, buyers are gonna buy how they're gonna buy. You cannot short circuit their process. Right. Yeah. So you, you have, if they're not going to buy on one call when they usually buy in three calls, they're not going to not check with their CFO. Right. But what you, this is what I'm saying is when you plug into their process efficiently, when you run a zoom meeting, the way they run zoom meetings internally, then you're in the system. All right. Right. Hey, can, can I finally get my microphone fixed? Can I come in for a second? Yes, you can Barry. Uh, I, I, I sorry about not having a webcam, but not, we talk about that offline. Um, I used to be CEO of one of the original web conferencing companies, place where we competed with WebEx. So I want to talk about virtual meetings, Zoom meetings, and, and talk about vocabulary to make some clarification here. There's web conferencing, which is what we're actually on. This is not a web meeting. This is a web conference. I can have a, a web meeting or a Zoom meeting with three or four players, and we can actually be brainstorming a new design for a product to roll out that's going to make millions of dollars when the economy comes back. So I'm brainstorming in that meeting. There's no selling going on, for instance. I'm just giving that as one example. Remember I mentioned there were 10 different types of meetings you can have virtually. And so we built capabilities to facilitate each one of these different 10 types. Oh, and what you're mainly talking about is a Zoom meeting, a sales, meeting. A sales meeting. Yeah, he's doing a sales meeting. Right. That's what yes. we're going to focus on. But, but you keep making it generic in your language. Got it. Right. Okay. Because okay? and, and, and what I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up is virtual meetings can actually be more effective than real meetings. Our tagline initially was real meetings, no travel. And then we changed the tagline to great meetings, no travel, because we actually had more effective, productive, with better outcomes doing virtual meetings and having real meetings. Totally. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't help my kids kindergarten decide what kind of water fountain, you know, to put in the courtyard. So all I do is finance and sales meetings. That's what I know. Right. That, that's your focus. But Barry, you're right. And I appreciate that. I'm going to go to our next question. And that is Lloyd. Uh, I'll unmute you, buddy. Lloyd, what is your question for Oren? All right. I'm going to digress a little bit because I know everything here is about, you know, current environment, current times. But I'm in an industry that is, I'm in the managed service industry, outsourced IT, right? We're a managed service provider. There's 55,000 of us nationwide. This industry is unbelievably ripe for consolidation. My question is, how big of an organization do I need to be in order to even consider starting an M&A roll-up type? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, so, you know, really, what we're helping come, it's hard to raise money today. There's a huge capital overhang, $760 billion sitting in private equity, uh, but they're not looking for startup or early stage or distressed deals. They're just looking for quality. The easiest, the easiest thing to do today, and what I would recommend is acquire something. It's very easy to raise capital to acquire something that's established. Maybe, you know, and all the reasons that somebody is interested in, in, uh, transacting, uh, aging management, um, you know, looking for an exit, looking for a recap, uh, de-risking. De so, so job one is I would look for things because that you could be one person and then go in and make the acquisition. So that's definitely where I would start is trying to put together some financing to make an acquisition. Where would one go to even attempt to do financing? Is it, is it your bank? Is it private equity? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, um, where uh, we start? Basically, you need a lower middle market investment bank. Okay. Okay. If, if you email me or in it, pitch anything, you know, I'll make some recommendations. Okay, thanks. But secondly, you know, I think uh, um, really in order to begin a consolidation play, right, uh, the, the, the issue is not so much how big you have to be. It is why would somebody be willing to sell to you? 
can you, so, right? So you, it, it's not so much that you need to be big, but you need to have some show of strength, right? You have to show up with a bank, a financing, a well-known industry group that has credibility because I am not going to necessarily want to go down the road with you or you and your 10, you know, or 20 person organization um, and try and sell to you. Uh, you know, when I'm, um, um, when you're, I'm going to view you as weak. So to answer your question directly, I mean, I think a five to $6 million income, $20 million revenue, $25 million revenue starts to have credibility to begin rolling stuff up. Now there's shortcuts to that. Like I said, which is, uh, you know, get to buy something, you know, with some financing, uh, and then, and then, um, you know, use that as an, as a platform to start acquiring other things, but really to get into roll up mode, which is a bit different, right? Yeah. I guess the difference is roll up. You're looking at eight, 10, 12, 15, 20 assets, right? That's going to require some core strength to acquire one, two, three, and sort of build that core strength. Um, you can go out on your own and find those acquisitions, but you're going to need a financing partner. All right. Lloyd, thank you very much for your question. Let's go to Pear. Pear, you have a question? Wait, let me unmute. Uh, no, I, I, not really a question, but uh, just to add to the conversation here that, um, as you know, we measure willingness to pay and we measure what drives willingness to pay. And, um, and we have seen differences in how that plays out before and after the coronavirus. Um, for example, some brands may, um, uh, we can see that they can, they, 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 they're going to lose a lot of business while other brands are not going to lose anything at all. We've seen that in, in some cases, willingness to, to pay goes up at higher prices and, and so forth. So the de decision landscape is going to be different when we come out. And if you're trying to sell the same way with the same arguments to, to your customers, it, it's not going to be as effective. Absolutely. Thank you, Per. I appreciate that. Let's go to John Vitale. John, what is your question for Orin? And from what I'm seeing, it looks like you're a real fanboy of Orin's. <laughs> yeah, Lauren, I drank the Kool-Aid. I read both books and oh, uh, I have a lot of friends doing startups. So I always get the first call like, hey, what the hell do I do? I got this great idea. So I yeah. give them your two books and I nurse them through a couple weeks of phone calls and they're just having a ball. Everybody loves it. Now they get to the point where we actually got some decks that are pretty good. They're ready to go get money. And yeah. I am reluctant to send them out because I think they're going to get disappointed. Can you raise angel money from five from 50 grand to $200,000 right now? Do you wait 30 days, 90 days, six months, or just go for it? Yeah, listen, absolutely. So I've worked with, uh, I've worked with hundreds of companies that have you know, raised money in the most unlikely circumstances and situations, right? And the, the, the tier one that's going to give you the highest chance of success is talk to people who are familiar with that space. Right. So if it is, you know, if it's a startup related to, um, uh, you know, virus controlling or anything like that, you know, find the high net worth people who feel like they're going to be insensitive to timing, not not insensitive, but they're they're not going to be um, they, they may be more pushed to action because of the timing. Right. So so um, somebody who believes in what you're trying to do and the purpose behind it is absolutely, I mean, it goes without saying, but that's going to be your tier one investor. The tier two are the, uh, you know, people who are contrarian. Hey, when it gets like this, this is when you get deals, right? Now the problem is, uh, well, not really, because you guys are going to be using safes. So I would not be reluctant by any stretch of the imagination to go out for financing right now. I'd prefer to do it in that market that you're talking about than in private equity because it's very clear what they're doing. But $25,000, $50,000, $250,000 checks, I mean, I'm seeing those. I, I, I mean, there's so many of those going around right now, I'm ducking them so that I don't get a paper cut when they fly into my head, okay? So it's, at, but, the, you know, but your approach has to be right. Um, uh, and, and, and so you're going to do more calls. You're going to do more outreach. Here's the secret to it, all right, to, to closing that. This is where I wanted to lead to. You have to be clear with the investors about your timing. Otherwise, they will say, I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking about it, I like it, I'm just 
having to do these couple other things. We're working on the PPP. I have another company that needs money, right? Say, look, we are a early stage startup, right? Irrespective of the current situation, we're working on startup timelines. And everybody knows what that is. A startup timeline is we're going to spend 35 to 40 days financing the company and not a day longer because we want to build products and do engineering and talk to customers. Talking three, four, eight, 15 times to an investor for 50 or $75,000 is not what we're going to fucking do. All right? So, you don't have to say it that way, by the way, but you can think that. <laughs> Here's what I think, right? Let's spend a week getting familiar with each other, right? Let's spend the following week circulating our term sheet. It's a safe, it's very easy to understand. I'll get a couple comments on it. And pretty much, you need to lean into go, no go position. Commit, right? And you need to reframe all the pro. You need to give them back all the problems that they're going to give you before they give them to you. I got to check with my wife. We got a committee. You know, we have an investment committee. We only meet every other Tuesday. You know, you should be familiar with the things that early stage investors say. There's like eight of them, right? I have to move some money. I'm waiting to sell something else. I got to check with my wife. We have a committee. Um, uh, you know, we're just finishing up our taxes. And that should be your flash roll, right? Which is, hey, listen, I know what you're thinking. You have a committee, you got to check with your wife, you got to finish up your taxes, you're moving some money, you got to close another deal, you're waiting for another financing, right? Clear up, if you can't clear up all that stuff in order to get in this deal, I understand, right? But let me know ahead of time so you aren't interfering with the work of an early stage company because I know that's the last thing in the world you would ever want to do. So you make this about the moral authority frame. You give them a clear timeline. And maybe you say, and here's the discount. Maybe you say, because of COVID, normally we would only spend 35 days doing this. We understand people need a little bit more time to, um, uh, you know, footstep, do fancy footsteps. So we're going to extend it to 45 days. But if you cannot get in on a 45-day timeline, I'm sorry, you're out. Right. And that's where you have control, right? You put, you, you, in essence, you're, you know, you're putting a virus somewhere on their side and you're controlling it. Right? You're, you're making, you're creating something valuable and then you're taking it away from them. And that's control. Let's go to uh, Harak. You have a question for Oren? Yeah. Hi, Oren. Uh, appreciate your time this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you for um, saying that. It's, uh, it's, it's just a general question. Um, I, do, uh, I do a lot of prospecting um, uh, for, um, uh, for my business. I do sales. And um, I'm finding that a lot of people are more hesitant to answer their phone calls than they were about a month sure. ago. So um, the way I'm kind of doing it, I deal with a lot of uh, small to larger size businesses in the, in the CBD industry. And so um, I'm realizing that uh, I'm more approaching them, trying to find out a little bit about how they're doing, how they're holding up in this whole COVID thing, and then also offering them a little bit of value uh, let, telling them about the SBA EIDL uh, loans that are available to small businesses and um, hemp and CBD businesses. So I'm finding that that's working, but I'm still, um, one of the verticals that I've been attacking is the, uh, the cosmetics industry and, um, and uh, much larger companies. And I'm finding that they're, uh, they haven't really been responding emails, phone calls or anything. So I just wanted to see what you're. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm getting triggered by a couple things you're saying, and I'm happy that you have it working, but that, um, so we work with so many law firms and accounting firms and service providers. Every single one of them is doing the same thing, sending us the PPP, you know, link and Hey, let us help you. Collection agencies are going, Hey, get the PPP money so you could pay, you know, these bills. So I feel like you're trying to add value, right? But everybody else, you know, the, it's only two links, right? And everybody else is already giving that value. So the value you're offering doesn't have that much value because it's already out of the bag. So I think you need uh, a, a, a sharper point of value to offer, okay? The second thing is um, I would not ask people how they're doing if they're in these kinds of industries that you're in because you know how they're doing. They're doing fucking horrible, right? So, uh, I, you know, I think that you need alignment with them is, hey, look, I'm, you know, you're one company and I know you guys are uh, definitely, you know, feeling the uh, pullback from consumers, you know, so I put some dimension on the economics and say you understand it. I'm working with a thousand companies like you and I want to share with you how some of the best ones 
are solving this problem right now today. Rock, thanks a lot. And, I appreciate and that. The, and the last thing is, yeah, I would just get out of pandering around COVID. I would just structure it as a prop. Hey, we know this is a problem. All kinds of people are solving it. It's likely that you sort of feel alone and isolated. I'm doing this with a thousand companies. There's a way through this. I'm, I, I can spell it out for you in, in four minutes, how other people just like you were solving it. Let's get together. Not looking for anything at the moment, but at least let me help. That would be real value. Hey, Orr, you know the old saying, a professional's expensive and amateur's a fortune? Well, you don't, because I came up with it. But that saying applies to you. You're, you're expensive, but other people that do it, they spend a fortune doing it. Might as well spend money on you, get it done the right way the first time. Don't give me a Jerry's Deli menu of what you do. Give me three things that people hire you for. Oh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very easy. They hire me to uh, raise money or sell their company. That's it. Number one. Number two, if they want to grow revenue, I step in. And if I think that uh, I can help them sort of double sales, I mean, I'm not going to help Oracle double sales, right? But a, <laughs> a 15, 30, 50 million dollar company that I can help them get to 75 or 100 million dollars, I'll step in and I'll make sales grow. That's it. And how do you come up with your pricing? How do you charge for that? So, you know, the same answer is how do you value your startup? Demand, right? If there's low demand, mm -hmm. if there's low demand for your uh, project, right, you're going to have a low valuation. If everybody wants to get in and it's a hot startup, you're going to have a high valuation. Got demand it. is de determines pricing. Let's go over to Justin Bookie. Justin, you have a question for Aaron. Justin, let's find on you guys. Yeah. Hey, Oren, thanks a lot for spending time with us. Um, I'm just hanging out in my warehouse. Coming yeah. over, you guys need a couple of rolls. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, part of this question is, is actually also a quick shout out to Pear Showforce, like I mentioned earlier, because he's helped me with some pricing issues for a, kind of a unique service that we're going to be rolling out post-quarantine, but it's very live event-based. Event it's really dependent on a lot of people getting together. Yeah. What I want to do is do some initial prospect surveys yeah. uh, at law firms, financial firms, and so forth to see what their pricing parameters are and where those, where those clusters will appear so I can create a pricing structure. But I'm thinking, are they really going to be in the state of mind right now when they're really working with distributed workforce, not anywhere near, hey, let's gather together and get a lot of people together. Are they going to be in the right frame of mind? to really discuss, okay, what are we gonna pay? What's the valuation for these live events? And if not, how do I get them there? Yeah, so I, I, this one I can answer more simply uh, than some of the other things. We're doing a live event in August, right? One, recognize we may have to move it to September. Number, but we're giving, it, when you sign up for that live event, you're getting a significant um, uh, price reduction for doing it now right? The, the focus on that event is very specific. You're going to come away with a useful outcome. So there's a poll. There's a reason to be interested in an August event, right? The other thing is we're giving content today from the last event. So you get something immediate. So if you can give something immediate today of value and you can focus the value of the, say, September event to be very specific to where you're going to get an outcome, that you're going to walk away with, then I think you could be talking to people about an event today. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Let's go to what? Nick. Fitch. Okay. Oh, good, Justin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just quick follow-up. What if there's um, no uh, preset template for this content that we can offer them because it's a it's a new type of service, you know? Um, I, I think you you have to you have to come up with something that they're going to get today for signing up. There has to be some real overwhelming like you know if you read uh, try and read flip the script i talk about it you need to get to some kind of double this is double what we would get otherwise below if it's below the double the value that they can just show up in september or october or whatever and just pay at the front door right um if it's sort of uh um you know if they buy it now they're going to get it for 80 percent, and it's 100 percent in september they're like, ah, in september we'll pay 100 percent. you just offer like two or three times the value by getting engaged today. 
just to let you know, Justin, uh, Sandy and I are launching a speaker's training course. It's a, a nine-week online, fully interactive, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, Zoom calls, uh, hot seats. It's very engaging. It's $10,000 for the nine weeks. The minute they sign up, classes don't start for two weeks from that point, but they get so much material for the first two weeks before it goes into live to where they're, they get a win right away. And every week we plan wins that they can have takeaways with on a regular basis. So the key is when someone pays for something, they better have something of value right away, not something they need to wait for. So cool. let's go over to Nick Bishop. Nick, you got a question for the amazing, incredible, and yes, that is his, is, it's not TRS-80, what is it, a K-Pro? What kind of computer do you think you got behind you? Oh, this? What is that? What is it? Uh, that is your, oh, I think this is, here we go. It's a pet. Oh my God, that's old school. That's real and it works. Yeah, things running. Yeah, I'm teaching my little boy to code on it. <laughs> I actually thought that was a background, like a screen background. Oh no, this is a. Uh, that's yeah. hardcore. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. All, All right. right, Nick, what's your pet? Yeah. Oh, there you the, go. The, the amazing, incredible Aaron with an old pet computer. Awesome. So I won't bore you with the details, but we've, we're, we're working on a consulting issue for CEOs in the current environment. And you mentioned yeah. earlier on this call, a sharper point of value to offer. Talk a little bit about whether the point to offer the ultimate goal is improve your legacy, Mr. CEO, Mrs. CEO, in terms of how you come out of this, or focus on the scrutiny that you're going to go through as an organization when you get out of this. Yeah, but he, th that's right, Nick. Uh, so I think the narrative that I'm hearing, where you know, I've just talked to 30 CEOs that are running 30 to 300 million dollar companies, right? And and here's what's really happening, okay? From a CFO and CEO level, is they're telling their board, hey, we're going to downward adjust for Q2 30 percent, 25 30 percent. You cannot downward adjust more than 25 uh, percent um, because that is a signal that you had no contingency plan in place. And you were just completely caught flat footed. Got it. So we're going to downward adjust 25%. For Q3, we're going to downward adjust 15%. And for Q4, we're going to down 7.5%. And then we're going to get on track. And we're going to publish a five quarter plan going forward from Q3. And we're going to stay on that plan. That is what we're helping our CFOs and CEOs um, pull together and picture their board. At some point, you can't miss and miss and miss and miss and miss and keep your CEO, CFO job. So I think it's less about legacy and it's more about. At some point, you have to go to the board or you have to go to the, in essence, the shareholders and say, we have a fucking plan. Here it is. And we're going to hit this plan for five quarters, right? And this is a real plan. And we're not going to come back every three weeks and readjust it. We don't care what happens in the market. We know what we're doing. Um, this this took, sort of took everybody by surprise. Yes, surprise. Yes, we were a little bit flat footed, but we've reacted. We've adjusted all the adjustments we're going to make. And here's our five quarter plan. That's what I think you can help people with. That's awesome. I love Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Golding. Hey, wait, did Chris Voss recommend that, by the way? Just wondering. I don't know. It may have been in his master class that he has. How's your master class going? Yeah, that, uh, mine? Uh, I don't know. I sent out, I, I don't have time to shoot master class because my own one that I have is so busy. And <laughs> Ken keeps calling me and asking me to run his as well for him. Uh, okay, let's go Here's to the thing, though, Ken, most people call me up to run their class while they're gone. You, you have the temerity to call me up and run your class while you're still here. That's what are talking like, about? This is good stuff. We're doing this together. Of course we are. I'm just kidding. You. Dude, man, I, you're one of my favorites. You, I, okay, fine. Hey, let's go over to uh, James Golding. What do you got? Mr. Golding, uh, what's your question? Hello, Daps. Uh, great to see you. Thank you, Ola. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Ken more more toilet you paper. Asked, yes. Uh, Ken, you asked this question of Chris yesterday or something similar. And I um, just want to share, share my thoughts here. So beyond our crocodile brains, yeah. is there anything that you can share about how to apply your principles, methodology in the approach pitch, the opening and closing of the deal with the opposite sex? Uh, yes. So <laughs> neediness. It is 100% about neediness. And I know Chris is a pretty good body language guy, as am I. Uh, but I think this is, you know, um, opposite sex 101, 
but in, in my experience, which I've been married for a while now, so it goes quite a way back, but um, neediness kills deals in that space. And also body language, leaning in and full you know, body language and um, uh, offering value. So what happens is the things that work in business, marketing, sales, your day-to-day, -day, Zoom calls, everything you do for eight hours a day in the personal environment are complete backfires. Trying to help, offering value, being interested, being considerate, being mindful, being thoughtful, uh, uh, being there, being present, being aware, trying hard. All things that customers love will completely blow up any deal in the world that you're talking about. How's that? How's that? Tell me, tell me everything you just said, how that will blow up in, in closing a deal with the opposite sex. You're saying be removed, be distant, be the opposite of everything you just said? Yes. Because, yeah, absolutely. I would not take Orrin's advice on that, guys. I'm I would take like my that. advice. Okay, listen, guys, I lived on Sunset Boulevard for 10 years. Uh -huh. if, you read, if you read the book, The Game, half of my, those principles in there are mine. Uh, you know, I Neil got him from you. So, so I can't get into it. <laughs> By the way, half of Sunset is all gay, and maybe I'll leave <laughs> with you on That's, that. I was getting to that. Yeah, I did. Right. Wait, I, you know, north of Santa Monica or south of Santa Monica? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, as you look at what's going on right now in deal flow, because yeah. you're you're a transactional guy. Yeah, you really are. How often do you actually either put skin to the game or take points in the opportunity? Uh, so really, if you can't, companies want you to have skin in the game. So 100% of the time, I'll per, if I can't get, you know, if I'm helping you finance a company, you know, at the $20 million level, and then it goes public three years later, and you use me and my IP and my skills and my methodology and my stick to itiveness to finance the company when it was very weak and sensitive, and then you go public and I have no participation in it, I, I mean, I just commit suicide. You know, it's, it's the worst feeling in the world and it has happened. So if I can't get some equity and some position in the company, unless you want me to have some position in the company, I'm not interested in the deal. I'm transactional, but I need to be in it for longer. I can't make enough money in a $20 million deal Got to it. make it worth my time. I need for you to become a $50 million and then a $200 million and then get acquired to go public for me to make any money at all. Let's just take it away now from all the deal flow. Let's just be honest. How important is it to have a book? How did that change things for you having book one and book two? Oh yeah. I mean, I think uh, two things for me is I was, uh, cause I work mainly on not to be mean, but shitty deals. Like I don't work on Yahoo and I don't take Tesla public. Like nobody knows the name. Like, I, you know, I sold, uh, uh, you know, 40 acres of chocolate plants to Hershey's in Hawaii. Nobody, I can't even remember the name of the deal, right? That's how bad my deals are. No, but they're $50 million deals, you know? So, so um, no one was going to ever remember me or my name. And then when the book, you know, got out there and it started selling and now it sold a million copies, I feel like I've left a legacy that can stand the test of time. I left something of value and it's not orange Clef came and went and it was before i had a kid too kids you know help but so the book anchors you to time right and you're not just going to come and go and leave nothing behind but some shitty deals nobody can remember so that's one thing but i think the thing you're talking about uh, other than legacy is how do people know you and this is absolutely right i don't have time hey tell me about yourself i don't have time to you don't have enough attention and there's not enough time in that call to make myself make the quality of my thoughts the quality of my prior work the my uh the the, the uh, quality of my behavior when i'm in a transaction i can't explain it to you but if, when you're in a book you can see my thinking my um what i care about and my values over a period of time and and you can come into the relationship knowing me. There's no way I can compensate for that on a 20 minute phone call. So it changes everything. It establishes you. You know, Garrett, Garrett White. I mean, he only does hour long videos. Now 
An hour long video, a movie, as he calls them, is too long for most people, but it doesn't matter, right? Unless you sit through that whole video, you can't fully know Garrett and be willing to pay him whatever it is to spend time with him. So a movie or a book you have to have. You know, I know how you are as a person. You're all over the place, not in a negative way. It's just you, you, you have adult ADD. How did you focus yourself to get that done? What methodologies did you say, hey, I got to write this book? How did you put the blinders on to get it done? I took money from the publisher. Got it. That was and, it. You had a yeah, responsibility. So, so, so I gave my word that it would be done. And that. Okay. Last thing before we all get out of here. Your dad, you pride yourself on being a father. You do. Yeah. Yeah. How do you make sure you have proper, and I know we're not supposed to say this as an entrepreneur, but how do you do proper life balance being father and being business guy? Oh, it's really easy. I prioritize my son over the business. Oh, really? Yeah. And that's it. So you'll lose deals, potential deals. Every deal. day. Every single day. But you know, long term, it's going to have a massive effect on that relationship with your son. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we get, I mean, that's a subject for a different day, but uh, I, every night I write him, I take a photo of him from the day before. I put it on a, I do a screen share. I mean, with thousands of them now. And uh, it's called the Asher note. I take a photo of him and I write what I like about, you know, what we did, what the situation was, whether it's Lego masters, whether it's the, you know, we're taking school on zoom, whether, you know, we worked out in the rain, we're now going for bike, whatever it is. I do a photo. I write it up guys. It takes me eight minutes now. So it'll take you an hour the first couple of times, but every day he rushes out of his room at six in the morning and looks for the Asher note. And, and so let me put a fine point on this story. I got woken up, uh, six 30, on what's today? Today's Thursday. On uh, Tuesday, Asher, my little boy, crawls up on my bed crying. Dad, dad, dad! I ripped the Asher note because he, you know, it's stuck on the wall, and he was so excited because it was a Lego Masters image, and he he took it off and he ripped it. And you know, he doesn't know that I can make it on the computer, and I have it saved in Illustrator and everything. And and uh, he was so distraught. So anyway, I because I have a good enough business, right? And I don't care. If I have to live under a bridge, I just want my little boy to be happy. I have one kid. You know, people with eight kids are like, yeah, whatever. You know, I can't do that, but I have one kid. So I love him a lot. Um, but yeah, I prioritize my family over the business. Everybody has to make their own decision on that. And, um, you know, probably older than a lot of you guys. And that's just a decision I, I made. It's the greatest decision. It is. Family should always come first. Thank you. Or, and I really appreciate you spending time with us. People want to hunt you down, find you. Where do they go? Yeah, just email me, or at Pitch Anything. And uh, I try to answer everybody personally. Um, uh, on my own. He's a class act. Oren, thanks a lot for being with us thanks, and educating us. Buy the books. Get the books and hire them. You want to close a deal? Do it the right way. That's the pro that you call in. Oren, thanks a lot. Thanks, Ken. I really appreciate it. All, all right, right everyone. See you guys at five o'clock tonight with William Quigley. Bye, all. Bye. <laughs>